Greetings and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle. I'm the pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. And in this episode of Word Magazine, I want to do something like another supplement to the review that I've been doing of the James White Thomas Ross debate uh, on the best underlying text for the translation of the New Testament. Uh, they were discussing the differences between the Legacy Standard Bible. Uh, which is based on the modern critical text and the authorized version, which is based on the traditional text uh, in the Old Testament, the Masoretic text, and the New Testament, the received text or the Textus Receptus, the great uh, Protestant uh, uh, printed text that was used for all the vernacular translations of the post Reformation, the Reformation, post Reformation eras. So, in this supplement, though, I want to look a little more closely at a few readings in the Legacy Standard Bible, especially at the ending of Mark. And I, I noted that one of my critiques of the debate between White and Ross was that in many ways, they didn't spend a lot of time talking about the Legacy Standard Bible. And I thought it might be interesting just to look at a little bit at the Legacy Standard Bible as again, as a sort of a supplement uh, to our conversation about that debate. So what I wanna do is I want to pull up on the screen, if I can, the website for the Legacy Standard Bible. I actually don't have uh, yet a hard copy of the Legacy Standard Bible. I need to get a hold of one. And if you're not familiar with the Legacy Standard Bible, um, this is a, a new revision of the New American Standard Bible uh, that was put together by uh, John MacArthur and people in his church and the Master Seminary and so forth. And so um, they were unhappy with some of the gender inclusive changes that were made to the New American Standard Bible. So apparently they were able to get the rights to it and they created their own revision of it. And again, I have not dipped deeply into the Legacy Standard Bible. I don't have a hard copy of it. And I'm just going to be looking a, a few places uh, online. But before that, uh, here at um, their website, uh, you can pull up the forward to the Legacy Standard Bible. And here are some of the things that are discussed in the forward. Uh, let's just look at this little section here that's called Alternative Readings. So um, they note, uh, in addition to the more literal renderings, notations have been made to include readings of variant manuscripts, explanatory equivalents of the text, and alternate translations that may bring out a play on words difficult to maintain in the text. These notations have been used specifically to assist the reader in comprehending the terms used by the original author. So I'm not exactly sure what this means. It, on one hand, it's talking about things related to translation philosophy that they have, they provide alternate readings in the notes apparently, uh, but it also talks about um, the inclusion of readings of variant manuscripts, so textual variants. And so, um, again, I don't have the hard copy to examine it, so I'm not 100% sure about um, uh, how exactly they format the Legacy Standard Bible text, what they do about notes, uh, what they do about disputed passages. Let's go back to the foreword. Sorry, I lost it one more time. And they also have a, sec a section here on the Greek text. Let's just look at that. Um, it says the Legacy Standard Bible uh, has the benefit of a number of critical Greek texts in determining the best variant readings to translate. So this is a, a modern translation. Obviously, it's based on the, the modern reconstruction method. So the translators say we 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 took several modern critical texts to reconstruct the text that we could that we could make our translation from. And they note that they use the 27th edition of Eberhard Nessel's uh, Novum Testamentum Graeche, supplemented by the 28th edition in the General Epistles. And this served as the base text. So basically they used the NA28. The, the NA28 had uh, the changes that were made to the general epistles by the, according to the use of the CBGM and, um, but otherwise in the gospels and the Pauline writings and revelation, 
It followed the uh, 27th edition. Then it says, on every variant reading, the Society of Biblical Literature Greek New Testament, as well as the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, were also consulted. So in addition to uh, the Nesalon 28th edition, they used the SBL um, Greek New Testament of 2010, and they also used the Tyndall House Greek New Testament of 2017. And then they add, in the end, each decision was based upon the current available manuscript evidence. So um, th th they're saying, you know, th they're, they're updating the text. It's a very modern reconstruction philosophy. The text is being updated up to the minute uh, with new discoveries and new methods. So very typical of a modern critical text. So let's just look at a few passages if we can. And let's just start off with uh, uh, Matthew yeah, 613, um, which would be from the Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. And you can see that the doxology uh, is included apparently in the text, but it is put in brackets. Uh, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So whereas in many modern translations like the NIV, the ESV, uh, it's put down in the footnotes. Here, at the least, it's included in the text, but it's put in uh, these parentheses. And I'm not sure, I didn't see it in the forward and the front matter, an explanation of what they believe the brackets uh, conveyed. I, do, do they mean, we think it's, um, it's doubted by some people, but we think it's legitimate, so we included it in the text? Or do they mean with the brackets what is meant uh, in the modern critical text? If the brackets are there, the editors think it's unlikely that this is original and maybe they just include it for historical purposes. So uh, let's take a look at another passage. Um, let's look at, let's look at Acts 8.37. That's uh, uh, another one that uh, is often disputed. And this is the confession of the Ethiopian eunuch. And apparently, again, I don't have the hard copy. Apparently this is included uh, within the text, uh, and you can see that it's put in brackets, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may, and he, being the Ethiopian eunuch, answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So um, let's just, just to make sure, I'm going to put Acts 8, 36 through 38, and let's just see. Yep, so it's you can see that verse 36 does, is not in brackets. Verse 38 is not in brackets, but verse 37 is. Well, we could say at least they don't put it down in the footnotes or remove it entirely, but it's there in the text. And But let's look and see what is done with 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Uh, the coma Johanneum, or the three heavenly witnesses. Uh, I, oh, I messed up. Seven. Oh, there it is. Let's look that one up. And in this case, the three heavenly witness passage has been completely removed, apparently. And given that there are no other notations, I'm assuming there's not even a footnote. So it's done what the uh, what the ESV or the English Standard Version editors did. They just completely removed it from the text. Again, this, I think this is an issue if you're confessionally reformed, you hold to something like the Westminster Confession of Faith or the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. First John 5, 7 is a proof text for the doctrine of the Trinity, and uh, it's completely removed from the legacy uh, standard Bible, apparently. Now, I'm just curious, given that they used um, uh, the Nestle on 28th edition, let's look at 2 Peter 3.10. And this is the one where in the Nesolon 28th edition, it has a complete um, conjecture in that it adds the negative particle, ook. Um, and so here it's, their translation is, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with, in, with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be 
found out. Um, and, and so uh, this is actually keeping with the NA27 reading here that doesn't include the negative ook. Um, it, 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 otherwise, it would say something like the earth will and its works will not be exposed. Um, um, and so instead, they say it will be uh, found out. So that's kind of interesting. Now, let's look at Mark 16, 9 through 20. Um, and we'll just look at the larger context. We'll look at verses 1 through 20 um, to see what they do with this. So uh, you can see that there's uh, Mark 16, 1 through 8. But then uh, they include verses 9 through 20, but they put them in brackets. Um, we can see that. But the thing that stands out really is here at the end. Here at the end, after verse 20, which in the received text and translations based upon it, this is, the, this is included in the text, no brackets. This is accepted as, as part of the canonical text. And it ends, uh, here's the translation, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. But now there is another uh, segment that appears, and this is also in brackets. There's a closed bracket. So verses 9 through 20, that's what we call the traditional ending or some call it the longer ending, but now there's another edition and there's no editorial head heading for it. So if you're just sitting down reading this Bible, um, it's just included, this is part of scripture. And, and so this last part has the brackets about it and it says, and they, apparently referring to the apostles, promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable preaching of eternal salvation. So what is this passage? Well, this is a this is a textual variant that is known as the shorter ending of Mark. And it is it is found in every manuscript in which is it, it is included between verses 8 and 9. Uh, so there are no extant manuscripts where this passage is put after verse 20. So the Legacy Standard Bible, as far as I understand, would be presenting by adding, putting the shorter ending as sort of an alternative or a supplemental ending to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is something unprecedented, uh, I believe, in the history of Protestant uh, Bible translations. Uh, I, I don't know of any others that have that have done this. Even uh, a lot of times, if you look at, for example, the, the, the New Living Translation, they include it, but they include the shorter ending between verses 8 and 9, the place where, where it appears in the manuscript tradition in a very few number of manuscripts. But the Legacy Standard Bible editors, nope, they've put it at the very end with no, um, maybe in the print copy they have uh, some sort of footnote or, or explanation, but here in this online edition, they don't have that. So I want to look a little bit more at this, uh, this uh, reading that they've included that's called the shorter ending. And I want to look, if we can, at uh, the article that I wrote. Let me just go back to the beginning. This is an article that I wrote um, back in 2018. Um, it began really as a paper that I did at, at a theology conference uh, in Texas uh, when I was uh, uh, there um, and for, for a theology conference in Houston. And then I took the article and I reworked it uh, into um, this theological uh, article that was our academic article that appeared in the Puritan Reform Journal. And it's available uh, on my academia.edu page. This is where we are now. So um, 
so uh, it, it's about the, the the title of my article is the ending of Mark as a canonical crisis, and I at one point in the article I review um, the various al alternative endings uh, that have been presented for the Gospel of Mark, and so here's my historical overview of Mark's ending as a textual problem. And so I, I laid out a, at least five distinct endings which appear in the manuscript tradition for the Gospel of Mark. First, The first one I called the abrupt ending, and that is if Mark were to end at Mark 16, 8. And there are only two early uh, extant manuscripts that give evidence of this, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. 99.9% um, .9 of the manuscripts I have the traditional ending, Mark 16, 9 through 20. So only these two end at verse 8. But you can see that my second of these five was the shorter or the intermediate ending, as it's sometimes called. And I said, in this tradition, the book ends at Mark 16, 8, plus the addition of what is known as the shorter ending. And then I said, there are no extant Greek manuscripts with this reading, but it appears in one old Latin manuscript known as Codex K or Codex Bobiensis. And so this would be, you have Mark 16, one through eight, and uh, that's where Sinaiticus and Vaticanus end. But the shorter ending uh, in the second alternative would be you have Mark 16, one through eight, and then you have the so-called shorter ending and you don't have verses nine through 20 or anything else. And so that's that. This is the second uh, 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 ending that I'm reviewing. And by the way, I I discuss a little bit uh, uh, Codex K, which is a, an old Latin manuscript, or Codex Bobiensis. You can see the footnote there, footnote nine. See the discussion of the ending of Mark in this manuscript in D.C. Parker, the Living Text of the Gospels, from Cambridge, 1997. Parker observes, quote, it should also be noted that this manuscript has a unique addition between verses three and four, but suddenly at the third hour of the day, it became dark throughout the whole world and angels descended from heaven and rising the glory of the living God ascended with him and immediately it became light, end quote. So I, I quote that just to say that Codex Bobiensis it has kind of a free tradition. Uh, not only does it end at verse eight and then has... Uh, the so-called shorter ending, but it also has a, a unique um, variant that's included uh, there between verses three and four. And I proceed, I said, see also the discussion of Codex K and Nicholas P. Lund, the original, original ending of Mark, a new case for the authenticity of Mark 16, 9 through 20. Lund observes, quote, Bobiensis exhibits a number of, you got to go down to this page, uh, unusual readings, in addition to the insertion between verses three and four, he also notes two so-called significant omissions in Kay's text of Mark 16, one through eight. Mark 16, one leaves out the names of the women who went to the tomb, while Mark 16, seven in Bobiensis omits the clause, and they said nothing to anyone. And then I ended the footnote. These variants, uh, these variations clearly indicate that Codex K should be characterized as a maverick manuscript with regard to Mark's ending. And so, again, of the options, you've got the short, the abrupt ending, end at verse 8, Sinaicus and Vaticanus. You've got end at verse 8 plus the so-called shorter ending or intermediate ending. Um, and you have, only, you have no Greek manuscripts, and you have one old Latin manuscript that is a maverick manuscript and has some strange readings in it. Um, and by the way, I also provided um, a translation of the shorter ending. I said it's translating the English Standard Version, but uh, in the, their footnote, but they reported briefly to Peter and those with him all that they had been told. And after this, Jesus himself sent out by means of them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. And you remember that because that's what the Legacy Standard Bible now has after verse 20. Uh, the third option that, of the five that I listed was the traditional ending, Mark 16, 1 through 8, followed by verses 9 through 20. And again, that's 99% of extant manuscripts, including some of the oldest unseals. 
And then uh, the fourth option that I talked about was the expanded ending. In this tradition, the ending of Mark includes the abrupt ending. That is, it goes to verse eight. The shorter ending, which has, it has that insertion that we've been talking about. And then it includes verses nine through 20. And I said, this reading is found is only found in seven rather late manuscripts, which will be discussed below. And then the last of the, of the five options is the traditional ending with the so-called freer logion. And there's really only one example of this. It's Codex Double Your Washingtoniensis. And it has the traditional ending with the insertion after verse 14 of a passage that is known as the freer logion. And there's also a reference made to this by Jerome, uh, but there's only one manuscript that has it. So although I listed five various endings, really that, that can be misleading. The dominant reading, uh, the vast majority of manuscripts is the traditional reading. And then the others are all minor variations. So since we're talking about the this, this so-called shorter ending or the abrupt ending, I want to I want to go down to the part of this paper where I discuss the seven extant manuscripts that have the so-called uh, a shorter ending or abrupt ending placed between Mark sixteen eight and and Mark sixteen nine and here we go uh, yeah so in the paper I talk about how that from the year three hundred to five hundred there seemed to be some controversy over the ending of Mark. And so let me just read this paragraph and we'll talk about the manuscripts that, that have the so-called shorter ending. Uh, I wrote, it was also during the period from AD 300 to 500 that we had the emergence of the expanded ending. That's the shorter ending added after the abrupt ending, after verse eight, and followed by the traditional ending, verses nine through 20. According to the apparatus of the Nesolon 28th edition of the Novum Testamentum Graecae, there are six extant manuscripts, codices L, Psi, 083, 099, 274 in the margin, and 570, and one lectionary manuscript, which is uh, lectionary manuscript 1602, that contain this expanded ending. The earliest of these, 083, could be dated to the 500s, that is, it's from the 6th century, while the rest are much younger. Here is a chart of the six New Testament manuscripts, which with the expanded ending, and their dates as listed in the Nesalon 28th edition. And there they are. So Codex L, dated to the 8th century, Psi to the 9th or 10th century, 083 to the 6th or 7th century, 099 to the 7th century, 274 margin to the 10th century, 579 to the 13th century. And then I note the final paragraph there, final line of the paragraph. These manuscripts provide then not only a witness to the shorter ending, but also to the traditional ending. And I'm simply making the point that these seven manuscripts Although they are the, that's it. This is what all we have for the Greek in the whole mass of the Greek tradition. We have seven manuscripts that have the so-called shorter ending, but all of them appear in manuscripts that where they're put after verse eight, but the manuscript continues to include verses nine through 20. So every one of these manuscripts are not only witnesses for the so-called shorter ending, but they're also witnesses for the traditional ending for Mark 16, nine through 20. And guess what? We have no manuscripts, zero manuscripts, where this so-called abrupt ending appears after verse 20. And so let's go back and look again at the Legacy Standard Bible. Um, they've included this, in my opinion, spurious reading that was clearly rejected and did not have any tenacity, the favorite term of a certain um, internet apologist, and was rejected and was, uh, was rejected as non-canonical by uh, the greater Christian tradition. And now, for the first time, I think, ever, it is 
included in a Protestant English Bible translation tacked on after uh, Mark 16, 20. And they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. And after that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable preaching of eternal salvation. Now, I don't perceive that in that, in that content of that verse, I don't see anything that strikes me as being particularly heretical or anything like that. But the problem is, this is a challenge to the integrity and the authority of the Word of God. This is, uh, this is a spurious statement, and there is not a single extant Greek witness where this spurious statement is tacked on to the end of this gospel. So the Legacy Standard Bible editors, translators have done something that is unique in the history of Christianity. And I wonder how many people, if they use this Bible, will sit down with this Bible and see that passage tacked on to the end. And they'll, they'll wonder, what in the world is this? I wonder, will, will there be preachers and Bible study leaders who will use the Legacy Standard Bible and who will attempt to preach and exposit this passage? It's just, um, it, it just, I think, is an, uh, an exhibition of the problems that we have today in broader evangelicalism uh, with an unstable text of Scripture. So I think this would have been a great idea, uh, a great subject uh, to have come up in the debate between James White and Thomas Ross, but neither one of them talked about this issue with the Legacy Standard Bible. Well, there are lots of other issues with the Legacy Standard Bible, like how the divine name is translated in the Old Testament, uh, how uh, the Greek term doulos uh, is translated in the New Testament. Um, I, 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 so anyway, there are lots of issues with the Legacy Standard Bible. But um, anyways, I, I, I just wanted to point out um, this particular difficulty. And I thought it was especially interesting given uh, that part of the, the content of the debate had to do with how many manuscripts contain a particular reading. You know, James White was critical of the received text because uh, in places it chooses to go with a minority tradition as in the use of the Fellowship of the Mystery in Ephesians 3.9, or um, the, the, the reading in Revelation 16.5, or the reading in the Coma Ioannaeum, which the Legacy Standard Bible completely jettisons. And um, I find it ironic that they do that, and yet they include a completely novel uh, innovation at the ending of the text of the Gospel of Mark, and they include uh, this this add-on spurious uh, verse, so-called, in a place where it appears in no extant manuscripts, and appears in only seven manuscripts overall, Greek manuscripts, and one of those is the lectionary, one it's in the margins, so really only five manuscripts where it's copied into the text proper, um, and uh, none of those are, are early. They're not papyri. They're not early unseals. Um, and yet this has now been incorporated into the Legacy Standard Bible. So um, I, would just, I would just say, readers, beware. I, I would not recommend the Legacy Standard Bible. And I think if you read it, look at it, you should do so with caution. Well, with that, I'm going to bring this episode uh, uh, to an end. I know this is a bit of a shorter episode, but I hope this will be a helpful supplement to the ongoing discussion uh, about the debate uh, regarding the Legacy Standard Bible. Well, hope this has been helpful and edifying to those who are listening. I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next edition of Word Magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.